First of all, I would like to say great thanks uh, uh, to the organize. I am very grateful for having been uh, invited. I would like to present the results of my study, which were received a while ago, and which enabled uh, me and my associates uh, to look from another angle the system of simulation and modeling of human diseases and to develop new technologies to resolve other problems as well. Although I don't work with zebra fish, I work with uh, mice models uh, and uh, human tumors, but what we develop nonetheless are evolving yet. And today I would like to tell you about the way we were developing the models of appearance of tumor in fish. That was the time when there were many hopes uh, cherished uh, about the fact that we are going to use different model organisms uh, and we'll be able to uh, deal with all the riddles of nature, but that's not the way it is. Zipper fish was the tiniest vertebrates model which enabled us to simulate some processes which was especially successfully done in developmental biology as the organism was develop evolving, developing, and it was the time when new chemistry appeared, uh, new compounds, libraries uh, have come on board, and we thought that we'll find medical drugs and then do the day based on those models. So we were at the very inception stage when we were cherishing lots of hopes in relation to zebra fish. Our group's task was to create a model, uh, ideal, ideal model, most desirably, so that initially uh, we would be able to search for no drugs based on that model. And for that, for that, we had to resolve some problems. We had to figure out what a model would look like. First of all, it should be reliable. It should be robust and it should reflect major properties of tumors which exist in humans. First of all, we're interested in humans, of course. And that model was also supposed to be quite convenient so that it would be rapidly reproducible and rather cheap, not very expensive. And it would be ideal if it would give the answers to many questions, not just dealing with one type of tumor or pathological process, but instead would reflect different things altogether. To create a model like that, we should have a toolkit like building blocks for those models creation to induce artificially tumors. It takes an awfully long period of time and it's utterly unpredictable. So we decided to look at mice model to use transgene technologies. Back them as to zebra fish and transgene technologies, there were several ways which uh, evolved. One of them was also developed at our lab, is the use of transposone uh, to introduce uh, aliens genetic material to zebra fish organism and uh, transposon system uh, uh, it was different from other systems uh, because first of all these transposes system didn't require some special factors for integration uh, into genome and it didn't have inherent regulatory elements which might impact the surrounding generic, genetic uh, uh, environment. One of those transposones was the transposone out of a plant, uh, 
and Barbara McClinton, and you see her, uh, she was awarded a Nobel Prize uh, from those transposition elements. That's uh, the oldest transposition element uh, which was described uh, for those uh, uh, cells. We clone this transposone. So it's possible to insert inside anything we can, uh, would like, uh, regulatory elements, uh, promoters, or coding uh, elements. We had the toolkit, the mechanism, which could be helpful for us for zebrafish uh, model. A zebrafish is very convenient. It's enough to induce uh, and a zebrafish egg at the stage one cell you initiate RNA and uh, DNA uh, the process and uh, uh, transgenesis uh, reaches a hundred percent with those transposons nowadays then what could we use which gen gene could we use to create cancer model, and we decided first of all to figure out which oncogene is mostly frequently met in mutations among uh, uh, tumor. It's RAS gene. Uh, so we decided to use uh, this transmutagenic gene as RAS, uh, but we needed a material and the location uh, where this uh, tumor would evolve, which would be convenient for manipulations, for observations, so uh, um, we would get enough uh, materials and specimen for subsequent analysis. So we tried to use liver, and we uh, were able to see whether mutations could be there in hepatic tumors. Uh, it does, it turns out, uh, to be, and actually it's number two after mutated beta cotinine. Uh, but beta cotinine is very, very large. Uh, uh, it's not all the tumors whereby it's mutated, so we decided uh, to use cherosin again. Then, as to uh, serous oncogene, we uh, just took it from zebrafish. And it turned out that apart from uh, uh, frequent mutations of this gene, it doesn't it doesn't differ from human ones. It's very ancient on the gene. There are just seven amino acids which are different between you human and zebrafish on the genes. So we decided that it could be a uh, mimicker. Uh, it could impact the activity of on the genes in human tumors. Second property of Keras is that uh, we can suture it with fluorescent protein and it will be functionally active. That's what we did. We had a delivery system for a transposome system. And we cloned carries and we made activated mutation and keras. We uh, combined it with fluorescent protein to observe the expression of this mutagene. And we use uh, a specific for hepatocytes promoter of zebrafish, uh, fatty acid binding protein promoter. It's a very strong promoter, which is mostly expressed in differentiated hypocytes, uh, hepatocytes, and we inserted this construct into transposone, uh, into transposone, and the promoter we initiated zebrafish with the hope of uh, 
obtaining a very straightforward system of tumor genesis. But it turned out that the early expression of ontogene uh, is uh, lethal for embryonal development. And among initiated by us, uh, fish initiated by us, only 50% uh, lived. Uh, until the stage of reproduction, uh, after which we decided to figure out um, will they reproduce the next generation. It turned out that only two founders uh, just also went on to next generation and what is going to happen to the next generation and the next generation in most part we see the uh, enlargement of liver you can see GFP uh, illumination here and uh, it's luminescent, but those fishes uh, didn't reach uh, a maturity or they did not produce uh, the posterity. Uh, this early expression evoked the disorders in hepatic development and fish uh, died uh, real soon after that. Nonetheless, we could do that all the same at the end of the day. Uh, this is the survival curve. Uh, if you check it out, so the first generation. provided us with the number of emerging tumors and mortality from them coming up quite rapidly. In the next generation, the incidence of tumors were happening most, most infrequently. And provided we propagated that onto the next generation, from generation to generation, uh, the frequency of tumor emergence uh, was reducing. When we started making comparisons and trying to figure out why it is that way, why in some instances we see higher frequency and some much lesser frequency, it turned out that the frequency of uh, tumor emergence uh, uh, depended a lot on uh, fish, uh, in expression of this oncogene. When we observed high levels of expression of oncogenes, we observed higher frequency of tumor. Uh, and uh, having said that, the survival and passing on this oncogene on to the next generation did not happen. In another line, the level of expression was much lower. At the same time, there was the same uh, prevalence, uh, uh, but tumors showed up much, much later. At the end of the day, as you see, similar approach enables us uh, to model, to simulate the tumors, but it's utterly impossible to support those lines. Uh, nonetheless, we have analyzed the situation, trying to figure out whether those tumors would uh, correlate to the characteristics of uh, tumors in humans, and will they demonstrate the same development uh, as human tumors. Uh, and it turns out that they repeat uh, the properties of human tumors at early stages after oncogene induction. Uh, there is hyperplasia, then hepatocellular adenoma, and at the end of the day, hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the terminal stage of uh, liver tumor, but unfortunately, only 26% of the fish which express this oncogene displayed full development of the tumor. All the other uh, fish just displayed changes in hyperplasia. And the analysis 
of the tumor also shows uh, that what we observe is the result of activation of uh, major um, uh, uh, pathways which are related to keras activation. And uh, this activation in the uh, sentinel uh, nodes pathways reflects the development of uh, the tumor. This model didn't comply with all our prerequisites, but uh, actually the principle, in principle, this approach enables us to uh, simulate, that is to model uh, the tumors in fish, which would be in their characteristics very much akin to those of human beings. Uh, apart from that, we made molecular assay at the level of RNA and uh, electrospectrum, and we found out that the two stages were observed, that is hyperplasia and carcinomas. They are drastically different from each other, but at the same time, all those stages correlate to the uh, grades of human uh, tumors. Apart from that, uh, apart from the fact that we have found affinity uh, in characteristics between uh, uh, hepatic tumors, it turns out that uh, the use of a RAS oncogene also reflects other human tumors, and we found uh, a great correlation of main uh, genes which were activated, not just in hepatic tumors, but also in the tumors uh, whereby uh, mostly uh, mutations of activated KRS antigene are present. This model is not just a model which shows uh, liver tumors, but it could be used by the same token for other models as well. At the end of the day, we came to the following conclusions. There is no way we can possibly use this model for a search of uh, medical drugs or uh, looking for new targets. Uh, for that, we had to deal with another problem. First of all, we can only use inducible system, which will not allow uh, the expression or the oncogenes uh, to express into embry embryo development, this expression would be lethal for a fish. And we would like to activate just when we want it on our own discretion. At the end of the day, we needed a system of control which would create temporary control for oncogene expression and tumor induction. Uh, on top of that, this system uh, should be a system based on uh, straightforward activation by some kind of a chemical substance and which uh, uh, would not have any side effects for the development, for expression, or anything else, uh, and uh, would not have any background expression. And it would be most desirable so that it should be unitary, so that we could manipulate uh, not just by uh, oncogenes alone, but uh, also locations of expression, changes of tumors, tumors in different organs. Uh, for that, we modified the system, which enabled us to create such a regulatory mechanism. We used uh, a progesterone-inducible system in our case. It will not be progesterone. It, it will be uh, analog, chemical substance analogous to progesterone, nephoprogesterone. As an activator, as an activator, we created new synthetic 
transcription factor which contains several elements. One of those elements, uh, or progesterone gas factor, uh, yeah, ligand binding, uh, which has good mutation, which could bind normal progesterone. It can bind only its synthetic uh, agonist uh, uh, to this ligand binding domain. When it is being synthesized, it is located in the cytoplasm because it is connected with chaperone complex HSP-910. After it binds to progesterone, conformative changes take place, it demerizes, and then it is transported into the nucleus where it binds to its responsive elements, and thus activates the expression of the uh, target elements. In this case, we used DNA binding uh, protein from bacteria. The LEXA operator, uh, as we call it, why LEXA operators? Because before that, inducible systems were created in Drosophila based on eukaryotic system. But in human, in the eukaryotic cells, it's very difficult to use it because gown flow finds lots of binding sequences in the eukaryotic genome. And hence, it has a very strong background binding activity. That's why we decided to use the bacterial one. Then to this DNA binding domain, we have added uh, progesterone binding domain and an activating domain from uh, nf kappa b receptor uh, effector, sorry. As already said, the inducible system has to be sufficiently cheap. and has no background. Why we use mephapristone? Because it is uh, really the cheapest out of all chemical activators of various systems, like tamoxifen or endocycline. This uh, mephapristone is the cheapest. The concentrations we used were very low and do not affect the expression of genes in zebrafish, zebrafish, meaning that the system really had no background. Thus, we created a binary system. We had liver-specific promoter. or an effector. The effector was uh, bound to DNA containing transactivone sequence of Lex operator that was uh, bound to Lex binding domain and was connected to the optimal promoter to drive the expression. When we added mephapristone, this LEXA activator was bound to the domain and impacted the expression of the reported gene in the liver. It uh, became a driver of this expression. In the absence of mephapristone, we have not observed any leakage expression of our reported genes. The first model 
we tried to use was the model developed and proven in mice. In these murine models, the so-called activated recombinant system was used when prior to the gene that had to be activated, there was a stop cassette installed. In our case, we had a cherry stop cassette. You see, it illuminates in the liver and the specific promoter. And uh, the combination that was induced when tamoxifen was added uh, and the fish, uh, plus the fish that had this stop cassette. So uh, these two fish were um, interbred. Uh, and uh, the result uh, was, after the addition of mefepristone, the tumor was generated. We could isolate mefepristone at any convenient time. It turned out that compared to constitutive model we had before, the inducible model, first the tumor developed much quicker. If we added mifepristone later, we didn't have uh, a large tumor. But this model had its own disadvantages. When we tried to create the models in adult fish, four to five months old, Oh no, four to five months after fertilization, we caused mosaic expression in short term mephopristone action after the tumor developed. The tumor's characteristics was not homogeneous. We had uh, tumors of various types. We could not achieve the same time tumor in all the cases like hepatoblastoma or HCC. It was always a mix of different types of tumors. So we decided to try the third way, and it uh, turned out to be the most successful and the most progressive. When we put the oncogene itself underneath the legs operator. In this case, it was uh, much simpler. If for career combination, we had to create uh, two generations that could be interbred. Here we interbred immediately after the first generation. For example, there's a driver. We had an additional AGFP gene that allowed us to select at the embryo stage, the fish we needed for further interbreeding. And the second uh, fish was Ross effector. In spite of uh, Ross uh, and the GFP, you didn't see any background expression. Uh, both fish had normal development of the liver and no abnormalities. After the inbreeding, Uh, interbreeding, uh, you see that the tumor after the addition of mefepristone developed extremely quickly, and the tumor development depended on the concentrations of mefepristone being added, so that we could regulate the time when the tumor appeared and. Uh, uh, the speed of its development. If we eliminated mifepristone from the system, depending on the time of incubation uh, in the presence of mifepristone, we could switch off the expression of the oncogene 
or in some cases if the time of pristone action was not long and the concentration is lower, the switching off uh, was uh, very quick. In the opposite case, uh, it uh, took longer time for the switch off, but it took place. Uh, we also uh, saw that the time of development of the tumors de uh, depended on the concentration. We could uh, choose the concentration of mefepristone that allowed us to uh, more or less uh, control a certain uh, size of tumor at a certain time. And different concentrations of mefepristone give rise to different types of tumors. That's uh, part C. And these types of tumors correlated to the development of HCC in humans. In this case, we created an ideal system for our, uh, for our conditions. In the result, we have chosen a specific concentration and started monitoring how the tumor is going to be developed and how to analyze it. All the other experiments and their results were also track and traced. You see normal liver on this slide. One month afterwards, we already have seen hyperplasia and hyperangiogenesis. After three months, we had low grade HCC and high grade HCC after six months. After six months of mefepristone impact, it was more difficult to analyze uh, the results because we had a mixed carcinoma or hepatoblastoma, and they occurred quite sporadically, not locally. We had uh, modular hepatoblastomas as well. So we decided to cut off the analysis of these tumors at six months. If we took the cells of these six months old tumors, and transplanted them to the fish, these tumors had all the features of tumor growth. So the tumors could be transplanted. And in addition to this, they could uh, generate metastasis after six months of uh, the use of mefepristone. Prior to the six months cutoff level, uh, time point, we have not seen any meds. These are the cells of HCC that uh, uh, generated metastasis in the pancreas. And it's the same, but uh, amplified. The uh, cells were uh, labeled with the GFP. You see metastasis in various locations. Besides, we have taken tumors at various stages of their development. The last one. The last stage is hepatoblastoma. The fish dies at that stage. And in terms of time, this is about eight months. All the others have uh, been taken uh, after each month. The main changes that took place in these tumors 
look, the first three stages are highly homogeneous and only the advanced stage differs uh, the other uh, stages drastically, meaning that histologically these tumors were very similar, but they were also similar at the molecular level. Thus, we concluded that inducible model reflected or met all the requirements we had. It was quite cheap, well reproducible. Tumor developed uh, within one month. The incidence was quite high. And we didn't have to manipulate with the person. So it was predictable and homogeneous. On the whole, the system was ready for, for further analysis. We use this model for drug screening, but actually that was not our main point of interest. We were interested in slightly different uh, aspects. When we induce the tumor, what happens? For whatever reason, after we induce the tumor, tried to grow the fish and were observing them, some fish returned back to normal, but in some other fish, the tumor never disappeared and the fish died. Such experiments in terms of activating of the oncogene and its further deactivation have been performed on mice before that. And the researchers thought that there was uh, such a thing as oncogene addiction, meaning that uh, tumors depended on the oncogene. Uh, on mice model, uh, the experiment was uh, held. Uh, there was, uh, the MIG was turned on, uh, oncogene activation, lymphoma uh, was uh, induced and then the MIG was uh, turned off and the cells died. But somehow the cells never uh, responded again to MIG. In the other system, it was a bit uh, different. It was uh, osteosarcoma and when MIG uh, oncogene was switched off after sarcoma formation, the cells passed over to the senescence uh, uh, state. Most probably it was uh, uh, quiescence uh, con uh, status, and then they differentiated uh, to bone cells. But if uh, MIC was turned on again, a different program was activated. The cells died. HCC turned out to be more, a little bit more mixed model. Some cells after uh, the MIC switch off and it was uh, the same oncogene. So some of the HCC cells uh, uh, died, some cells uh, transferred into the senescent status, the others into the uh, silent status. When the uh, oncogene was switched off on again, uh, some of the cells uh, moved to differentiated uh, status. The others died. We knew that at six months uh, Mifabriston, we had HCC 100%. In the course of the four months, we used Mifabriston until they had HCC, and then we removed uh, mifepristone and looked uh, at the regression of the tumor. 
So if we removed at this stage, 90 to 95 percent of fish returned back to norm. They had no tumor. But if we continued mefapristone and removed it later, this share of uh, surviving fish was uh, smaller and smaller. The tumor reversal was uh, smaller. So we decided to stop at the model, which was reversible. And look what was going on there. In all the tumors that we could reverse, all these tumors developed up to the stage. In order for different, uh, so the differentiating factors were switched off. This column shows hepatoblastomas, where there are no dose transformations. All the factors of differentiation, they're always regulated. And all the factors uh, inducing unlimited growth, they are all activated. I forgot to insert something else here, but just trust me uh, on my word that all the tumors which could be reversed, all those stages, all those tumors had DNA damage uh, cascade, uh, activated cascade, uh, whereas uh, the uh, tumors which were not reversed in those tumors, that cascade was fully deactivated. What uh, is happening to tumor uh, when we remove mifepristone? Uh, so if you check it out, that fish was treated for four weeks for uh, by uh, metapristone uh, uh, to induce uh, hepatitis uh, uh, carcinoma, then we removed it. And it turns out that if here all the tumors, uh, all the cells uh, are yet tumor cells, then some cells are reversing to the normal stage and they start reforming the hepatic structure, which was fully damaged by the presence of activated oncogene. And the further, and the further we are digressing. The further we are digressing in time from this, the more and more, and more cells uh, are reversed to normal stage. As a result, Uh, here it's more close up, you'll see it much better. Here you can see some tumor cells yet, but at the end of the day, oh, only tumor scar is remaining. Uh, that is uh, hepatic tissue, but it has got alterated, altered structure due to fibrillation and neurovascularization, which uh, took place uh, uh, on the allocation of the um, uh, tumor. And fish with cell carcinoma, hepatic carcinoma, it's hepatoblastoma great already in this fish. So in this particular instance, uh, we reversed the tumor so we can switch off the oncogene. It is possible. And then the tumor will disappear. Everything will be reversed back to the normal stage. But nonetheless, Having said that, when we started the 
looking at it, uh, trying to figure out what happened to those cells. Uh, they were uh, activated uh, by rice oncogenes, but what is happening to them right now? What is happening? So, yes, first, pathways were activated, but deactivation of those pathways is happening way slower and even slower than the morphological changes uh, in liver. You can see uh, there is a big amount of activation of uh, kinase here uh, the cells uh, uh, continue going towards apoptosis maybe it's uh, related to the morphological changes uh, when uh, new structures are being formed but nonetheless there is this delay Uh, back then, we decided to uh, look what happens at transcription level. This is the flow chart for transcriptome analysis. Uh, we treated it only to one grade only to hepatocell carcinoma. Then we did partial regression, and we uh, actually harvested RNA, RNA after two uh, months uh, withdrawal. And you can see uh, yet GFP here. Um, it takes so long for regression to come. But six months after the removal, actually, we see the tumor regression and the liver is back to n normal. We harvested RNA here and we made a comparison to find out what happened at the level of transcriptome. And it turns out that in partially regressed, uh, reversed tumor, we identified a lot of activation and regulation managings did not change. but. Out of those genes which did change, it turns out that when the uh, tumor was fully reversed, some genes uh, uh, went back to the normal stage and became in line with the hepatic function, and some genes being activated, they remained activated. And there was a plethora of such genes. Uh, there were less genes which underwent the reverse changes. Mostly those were the genes, more structured genes, uh, uh, which participated in the formation of uh, cellular matrix. Uh, they were not uh, that necessary for restoration of hepatic function, and they were in much less numbers. Uh, and uh, at one point, I had a sort of an insight uh, because actually we obtained those results very long ago and I sort of uh, neglected them, them for a while, or rather we published two articles which demonstrated that changes in activation of uh, uh, some of the pathways uh, changes the status of chromatin, chromatin in cells. Uh, and those 1,500 genes are retained there due to the changes in heterochromatin. Heterochromatin was fully changed. That is, cells, uh, notwithstanding the fact that they were continuing exercising uh, hepatic functions, but they are not quite liver cells. Uh, they have got some other functions as well by now. And one of the slides I had, uh, it showed what really happened uh, to tumor we used for aggression. Those were tumors uh, with activated uh, pathways uh, responding to 
DNA and stress response. They had stress response. It's those cells which undergo stress transformations and most likelihood they are more uh, liable and liable to chromatin changes and they cannot uh, uh, regain their genetic memory in order to uh, restore the transcription landscape of the cell the way it had been before. Are you close to the end? Yes. Okay. So the использование этих моделей было. Oh, those models was published in several journals, also by our collaborators. The work was made by two students from Singapore University. Uh, Anton Guyan and Vivian Kuo, they work in Changu Laboratory, and they continue working with the models developed by us. Once again, thank you very much. I'll take your questions, Ivan. Dr. Kozlov. Alexander, uh, this uh, uh, tumor scar, how is it different? Are there more uh, commu uh, just uh, communicative tissue there? Yes, more communicative tissue. Those scar cells are less structured, uh, but nonetheless, there are hepatocytes there. Yes, let's say. Uh, it's a cell transcriptome. If we make it, we'll find something else which might be interested there in those tumor scars after the regression of the tumor. Yes, we observe a lot of things there. And those genes which remain in the expression, these are the genes uh, which are in those uh, cells, not in the normal cells and most likelihood. Professor.